Before I begin my homily, I'd like to just make a brief announcement. The bishop, two days ago, or three days ago, Thursday, on the 13th of May, said that now we can have 75% capacity in the church. So little by little we are opening up, and of course, as the CDC gives new guidelines and everything else, I'm hoping that not only Father Stephen, but most other people, at least those who would like, won't have to wear masks, but this again is the decision of the bishop. As the present moment tells us, we are still called to wear masks, to sanitize after church, and to keep, as the bishops say, a safe distance. So I think obviously anyone who's ever been to a store in these past 13 or 14 months realizes that no one is social distancing. So there is no place on this earth safer than a Catholic church. And I see everyone nodding, so they agree. So it's so safe, I think we can even, well, anyways, all I can say is at least little by little we're opening up, so let's continue to pray that that be the case. And that's only for sacramental gatherings, so for masses, uh, anything that is a mass here in the church, funerals, weddings. So anything of a sacramental nature is 75%. Uh, for those other gatherings on church premises, it's 60% or 1,000 people whichever is less, so I think, because our buildings are not big, 60% is less than 1,000, unless we're talking about little pucians, but we're not, so. Today in the Gospel, St. Mark tells us that at the moment of the ascension, Christ was taken up into heaven and took his seat at the right hand of God. Now this is what we profess in the Creed every Sunday. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, God the Father Almighty. And these words, as we know, are very important because the creed summarizes the essence, the fundamental principles and truths of our faith. So the ascension is not something secondary. It's not just an anecdote. Well, Jesus, after his 40 days here, after his resurrection, went back to God. Now, there's something very specific about his ascension that had to be mentioned in the Gospels. Now let's remember, first of all, that the life of Jesus after his resurrection was a different form of life. There was something about the post-resurrection Jesus, about his body, that was not the same as the pre-resurrection life. We see that in the case of Jesus after his resurrection, he comes and goes as he pleases. He passes through the tomb. He passes through locked doors. On the road to Emmaus, these two disciples are speaking, and suddenly Jesus is there in their midst. So there's something very special about the body and the presence of Christ after his resurrection. He now has a glorified body. It can be here, there, and anywhere Jesus wants to be. And in today's gospel, this glorified body will now return to heaven. It goes from the earthly realm to the heavenly realm because now his body is no longer a body of this world. It doesn't undergo, it's not subject to the principles of this world. But there is an important fact to remember. Something that is very, very prominent, prominent you could say, in his resurrection appearances. The marks on his body. Although they don't recognize Jesus, there must have been something that basically hid Jesus in a certain sense. He was unrecognizable. They could still see it was the same Jesus. He had all the marks in his hands and his feet and his side that he had received from the crucifixion. And this tells us that the resurrection does not undo the crucifixion. The resurrection completes the crucifixion. And this is especially important for us because we realize before we can be resurrected with Christ, we too must undergo our own crucifixion. We have to nail to the cross our vanities, our follies, our wickedness, and our sin in order to participate in what we call this newness of life, the newness of life which is about dying to sin. This is what the Christian life is about. The Christian life is about dying to sin. It's not about living in sin and saying, oh, Jesus loves me so everything's all right. No, that's not the newness of life. The newness of life is about dying to sin. This is what the crucifixion reminds us of. And because he was crucified, because he offered a perfect sacrifice to the Father, Jesus was glorified. So resurrection completes the crucifixion. And brothers and sisters, this newness of life that Christ gives to us and pours into our souls at the moment of baptism 
We have now and possess the glorified life of Jesus Christ, who is now at the right hand of God the Father. Whenever we receive a sacrament, we are being filled with this newness of Christ's resurrected and glorified life. St. Paul will say, it is no longer I, but Christ who is living in me. And it's only possible because now Jesus has been glorified. And this helps us to remind or to remember something else about the significance of the ascension. As I mentioned before, sometimes there's, I guess, this temptation that maybe it only happens in my little puny brain. But to think that somehow after the ascension, Jesus is no longer with us. He goes off and he sends the Holy Spirit and now Jesus is simply there in heaven. No. Jesus is in heaven. Physically, because now his glorified body, united to his divinity, ever since the moment of the incarnation, his body will never, ever be left behind. And he ascends into heaven with his glorified body. But Jesus is very clear in the, in the Gospel of St. Matthew. He says, I am with you always to the end of the age. He says this right before he ascends to the Father. And this is what St. Matthew records in his Gospel. Jesus does not abandon us. Jesus does not leave us orphans. So the ascension reminds us that, yes, Jesus now is truly bodily in heaven, but he doesn't cease to be less real or less bodily present here on earth. Because of his glorified humanity, Jesus, Christ, the God-man, can be present at any place, at any time. Not just in heaven. There are even saints who could bilocate. St. Alphonsus Liguori apparently had a mystical experience. He went into ecstasy, and when he came out of the ecstasy, he told the person who was next to him, he said, I just saw, I was in Rome, and I saw the Pope just breathe his last breath. And sure enough, the Pope died in that very moment. St. Alphonsus was actually there present in two places at the same time, Padre Pio, St. Martin de Porres. So if even saints, little human beings, can be in more than one place at the same time. How can we say that Jesus Christ, who is now glorified and sitting at the right hand of God the Father, cannot be in as many places as he wants? His risen body now possesses a unique quality that it did not have before. And as the God-man, as the incarnate Son of God, he truly can do much more than pass through locked doors. Now he is fully present, continually with us, specifically in two places, we can say. In heaven at the right hand of God the Father, and also he is absolutely, fully, and totally present in the Eucharist. He is no less present in the Eucharist than right now as he is in heaven. Think about that. After the words of consecration, Jesus Christ, the glorified Son of God is now here just as present as he is at the right hand of God the Father. He has a glorified body. Christ can do all things. And this, brothers and sisters, really puts into perspective what the Eucharist is. The Eucharist is not just some nice little piece of bread. The Eucharist is absolutely, truly, fully, really, and substantially Jesus Christ, the same Jesus Christ who now sits at the right hand of God the Father. So Jesus has done anything but abandoned us. He is present at every single Mass. But there's a second way that Jesus, although in not the same way, there is another way in which Jesus is present, as St. Paul points out in today's second reading to the Ephesians. He says, He has put all things beneath his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of of the one who fills all in all. In other words, the church, the church is where Jesus is. That's why the church and the Eucharist are not secondary. We cannot truly be members of Jesus the head unless we are members of his body, the church. Three weeks ago we heard the beautiful parable of the vine. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. What happens when we're cut off from the vine? The same thing when we're cut off from the body. Brothers and sisters, we have to understand that Jesus is truly the head of his body, the church. And at every moment, he is standing, even as I speak right now, at the right hand of God the Father, interceding and pleading for us and filling us with his glorified life through his body, the church. And how is this possible? Because as the Catechism says, 
When it says that Jesus now sits at the right hand of God the Father, he ascends into heaven, goes back to God the Father. By the Father's right hand, we understand that the glory and honor of divinity where he exists as the Son of God before all ages, but now is seated bodily after he became incarnate and his flesh was glorified. So Jesus Christ in heaven is absolutely present before God just as he is present here on earth. The only difference is that in the Eucharist, his presence is veiled. We don't see the full glory of Jesus, but we know that he is here. He is just as equally present in the Mass as he is in heaven. No other place on earth, even the most exclusive megachurch, nothing compares to the presence of Jesus. The only two places where Jesus resides, in heaven at the right hand of God the Father, and at the holy sacrifice of the Mass, and in every tabernacle of the world. To understand this, we have to truly understand what the letter to the Hebrews is telling us, because the letter to the Hebrews explains to us how God, or Jesus Christ being at the right hand of God, his Father, is truly present in the Eucharist at every Mass interceding for us. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, it says, He, Jesus, has entered heaven itself, where he now appears in God's sight in our behalf. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 24 and 25, He, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently. His death on the cross was realized, yes, once in history, but the priesthood of Jesus doesn't stop after the moment of his death. The priesthood of Jesus is a permanent, eternal priesthood. The letter to the Hebrews says he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. At every single moment, they've even done studies, calculations. Every single second, four masses are taking place. In fact, right now, somewhere in the world, three other congregations are enduring, which you're enduring right now. I'm just kidding, of course. I'm sure it's great joy and pleasure and everything else. But the point is this. There is never a moment when a Mass is not being celebrated. Never a moment. The sacrifice that Jesus offered once and for all is perpetuated continually, everlastingly, because Jesus, who sits at the right hand of God the Father, is interceding through us, and he gives us the Eucharist. Through the Eucharist, we are now making heaven come down to earth. That is the Eucharist. That, brothers and sisters, is the Mass. And remember our Lord who is in the presence of God with the marks of his passion. This is his redemptive sacrifice presented everlastingly. He is, that's why he retains the marks of his passion. He is there before the Father interceding for us. This is what the Mass is. The Mass is the public act of worship of the church. Nothing can compare to the Mass because nothing replaces the presence of Jesus at the Mass. Nothing. And this puts the Mass in a proper perspective. Through the ministry of the priest, Jesus offers the same self, his self once again. But it's not as if he's killed again. It's not as if he dies again. But it truly is a sacrifice because what was once bread and wine now becomes really his body and his blood. And the priest, in the place of Christ, is now offering through Christ in heaven who stands before the Father. That's the Mass. That is why we come to Mass, to unite all of our prayers, all of our intentions to Jesus, the eternal High Priest. Through Him, we know that our prayers will be heard. And that's why, brothers and sisters, we know that we here, although living in a very weakened and fragile body, we still have the risen Lord that lives in us. It is in the risen, glorified Jesus Christ that we live. As members of his mystical body, as members of the body of Jesus Christ, we are built into his humanity. The humanity in which he lived among men, he died and rose again. So now, when we receive sacraments, we receive God's grace, we're actually receiving the very glorified life of Jesus, who now is at the right hand of God the Father. Now, obviously, we know that God, as God, sustains all things in being. 
nothing would exist unless God were to maintain it in being. So we can say that Christ as God, in a sense, is everywhere. But as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, made man, born of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who suffered and died and rose from the dead, that Jesus Christ, we call him the God-man, God become man, he is only present, as I said, in two places, in two ways. He's only present in heaven at the right hand of God the Father, and he is only present here on earth in the Holy Eucharist. And this, I think, puts into perspective our practice of adoration. When we come to adore Jesus, we don't just simply say, well, this is kind of a sacred place. Jesus Christ is truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. It is the whole Christ. It is the one who is true God and true man, his divinity and his humanity, his body and his soul, his human thoughts and emotions, his flesh and blood, everything that makes him into a human being is here. It is veiled. But Jesus, when we come into the church, can speak to us because he is truly present. I believe of St. John Vianney, when he would come into the church, he would see a little French farmer. And this French farmer would just sit in the back of the church, the church was empty, and just sit there. And he'd sit there for hours and hours and hours. And so the saint asked him finally, you know, I see you here a lot at church. What are you, what are you doing here all the time? And he just said, little farmer, I look at him and he looks at me. Because it is Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, we know that besides his presence in the Eucharist, we have the continued activity of the body, of the church, in his word, the liturgy, the assembled community, the action of the minister. And this is certainly a presence of Jesus Christ. It is not the same presence because in the Eucharist, and in the Eucharist alone, it truly, really, and substantially is Jesus, the same Jesus who now sits at the right hand of God the Father. And I think if we were to begin to truly appreciate this, we would understand how the great saints approached the Mass, how they approached the Eucharist. They would understand that the Eucharist is indeed the sacrifice instituted by Jesus Christ so that we can have access to the Father through Christ. And that is the Mass. The Mass is the perfect act of worship because it is Jesus who offers it. Yes, through a very weak and humble priest, or in my case, a very proud priest, but it doesn't matter the sanctity, whether I like the priest. The Mass is the Mass because it is Jesus who now, standing at the right hand of God the Father, intercedes for us. And in a few moments, the very same Jesus in his glorified humanity, will come down to earth, to this altar. And we are going to receive and come up and experience and be filled with the glorified humanity and the divinity of this very same Jesus who at this present moment sits at the right hand of God the Father at his ascension.